It is true that some preach Christ out of envy, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, that I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether in life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Well, welcome. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are honored that you've chosen to start your week off by worshiping with us here at Preston Christian Church. I want to welcome all of those who are joining in online from whenever and wherever you are. We are so grateful to have you as a part of the PCC Church family. If you're a newcomer in the room with us today, I'd love the opportunity to say hi to you. Out in the lobby, off to the right, we have a place we call Pastor's Point. I'll be hanging out there after the service. Uh, would invite you to come by and introduce yourself before you leave. Well, today we we are uh, diving into week three of this series that we've been in through the book of the Bible we call Philippians. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn them on or turn them to Philippians chapter one. That's where, we're, where we are going to be today. I do want to remind you to bring your books with you. If you have one of these, it's a great place to take some notes, ask some questions. If you don't yet have one of these, so this is a booklet that we put together to go along with this series. It's got content for groups, uh, content for families, discussions. It's got stuff for you to study and think about and pray through uh, throughout the week because we want you doing this every day, not just on Sunday. So if you don't have one of these and want one, just raise your hand up right where you are and one of our ushers will grab one of these. Uh, And today we're going to be in week three. So again, you can grab that and join me in week three today. Just keep your hands in the air. The ushers will find you eventually. Here's where I want to begin um, today. I want to I think about one simple question, and kind of the whole message is going to revolve around this one question. And here it is. What does your suffering tell others about your Savior? So this is what I want you to think about today. What does your suffering tell others about your Savior? When your circumstances, when your life circumstances are difficult, like when it gets really difficult, whatever that looks like for you, whether it's relational difficulty, health difficulties, whether it's financial, whatever it is, whenever life gets really difficult for you, when things are at their worst for you, what do those around you who are watching your suffering, what do they learn about the worth and might and power and value of Jesus by watching you suffer. That's what I want want to talk about today. That's what I want you to think about today. And the reason is because I think in our text through the Apostle Paul that we're given what I think may be one of the best examples of what our attitude and actions should look like in the midst of suffering. That through Paul that we get to see what, what a good example of showing off the worth and value of our Savior is in the midst of suffering. So we're going to pick it up today where we left off last week, which is first, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 12. Paul writes, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Now, begs the question, what happened to him? And I'm glad you ask. Now, for those of you who have been around for the last few weeks, you know a little bit about what's happened to Paul. So Paul is writing this letter to an ecclesia, to a church in the city of Philippi. And he showed up in Philippi about 10 years before he wrote this. 
And when he first showed up in Philippi, a few things happened. One, um, he got arrested. He got drugged before the magistrates. They stripped him and they beat him. He and Silas were thrown into jail, put in the dungeon, placed in stocks. God did a miracle, shook the jail, the doors come open, the chains fall off, but Paul did not run for his life. In fact, he stayed there so that the jailer who was uh, in charge of him could find life. So he gets arrested, he stays in jail overnight. The next day, the magistrates of the city of Philippi, Philippi realized that they made a huge mistake, that they had no right to beat him. They had no right to put him in jail. As a Roman citizen, he deserved a trial before he was punished. And they were going to be in big trouble, so they walked to the jail and they politely asked Paul to come out and to go away. So they just wanted him to walk away quietly. And so Paul ends up getting kicked out of Philippi. And all of the people that he's writing this letter to, these brothers and sisters, they, they would have known that part of the story. But they may not have known the rest of the story. The rest of the story is included for us in the book of Acts, starting in chapter 17. So I won't read it all because it's long. It goes from chapter 17 to chapter 28. But I want you to know a little bit of what happened to Paul after he left Philippi. So he leaves Philippi, gets escorted out of town. He ends up going to Thessalonica. And the text says that some bad characters came to Thessalonica. They formed a mob and they started a riot in the city in response to Paul. Like they want to get rid of this guy. They start a riot and they force Paul into hiding. They go search in the city trying to find him and they they went, the mob went to the house of one of his companions. Paul wasn't there, so they drug his companion, most notably a strapping young lad named Jason, who gets drugged before, gets drugged before the authorities, and Paul is forced to sneak out of Thessalonica under the cover of darkness. That's what happened after Philippi. He then goes to a town called Berea. Again, he shares the gospel. People believe. But those agitators, the text says, from Thessalonica get wind that Paul's now over in Berea. So let's go over to Berea and we'll do it again. And so they go to Berea and they start raising a fuss again in Berea and again force Paul out of town. He ends up in the city of Corinth. And things were going well for a while. In fact, he stayed in Corinth for about 18 months preaching and sharing the good news of Jesus. But after about 18 months, it happens again. And there's this united attack against the Apostle Paul. And yet again, he is drugged before the authorities. He ends up going to Ephesus for a while. And again, things were going well in Ephesus. He actually stays in Ephesus for about two years. But after two years, again, the same old, same old happens and a riot breaks out again. And this is the biggest and most notable of all of the riots. The whole city is engulfed in this thing. It starts in the marketplace, but so many people come and are involved in this that the text says that the whole mob ends up swarming through to the theater outside of Ephesus, which holds thousands and thousands, maybe 10,000 people in this theater. And this mob pushes everybody into the theater. And the text says that half of them don't even know what they're doing. They're all yelling at each other and some were shouting one thing, some were shouting another, and some didn't know why they were there. It's kind of like social media. You just got everybody yelling and nobody knows what they're doing there. And so everybody's screaming and Paul just wants to stand in front of the crowd and preach. But the authorities are like, Paul, if you go out there, they will rip you from limb to limb. You can't go out there. But that's all he wanted to do. He, he gets out of Ephesus and, and he's starting to head back to Jerusalem. He feels like God's calling him to go back to Jerusalem. But he knows if he goes, things are going to end badly for him. But he decides this is what God's calling him to do, so he does it anyway. On his way back, there was a ship he was supposed to take, but there was a plot to kill him when he gets on the ship. And so he had to forego taking the ship and take the long way around, marching around to get back to Jerusalem. 
He finally gets to Jerusalem, and sure enough, he wasn't in the city a week uh, before another riot breaks out. And this time, they get a hold of Paul. And the text says they're beating Paul. They drag him in front of the temple, and they are beating the life out of him. The text says the intent was to kill him right there in the streets of Jerusalem. The only thing that saved his life was one of the Roman commanders who was overlooking the temple, sees the commotion, hears the commotion, runs down to the crowd that is beating the life out of Paul, and he disperses the crowd by locking Paul up, and the text says, into two chains. Like one wasn't enough, puts him in two chains and starts to drag him into the jail in Jerusalem. But while he were going in, the mob begins to violently chase after him again, so much so that the soldiers who were guarding him had to pick Paul up and carry him into jail for his own safety. He's waiting there in the jail to go on trial there in Jerusalem And while he's waiting to go from the jail to his trial, 42 men, the text says, plot an ambush for when they take Paul out of the jail and take him before the magistrates. They're going to ambush and kill him right there in Jerusalem. But luckily, Paul's nephew catches wind of this plot, tells the Roman authorities who then send out a detachment of 200 men, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to move Paul out of the city. We can't try him here. He's, they're just going to kill him. They're going to ambush him. So we've got to get him out of town. And so they take this detachment of soldiers and march him from Jerusalem to the city of Caesarea. And he waits in the city of Caesarea for two years to get a trial before the governor named Felix. But Felix would never give him a trial. So he's sitting there in prison in Caesarea for two years. Felix finally is put out of office and another governor named Festus is put in his place. And Festus hears about Paul and brings him before him. Some of the people who were trying to kill him come to Caesarea and say, hey, he needs to go on trial in Jerusalem. And Festus wanted to make those people happy. He says, okay, I'll just send him back to Jerusalem then. And Paul, knowing that if he got sent back to Jerusalem, it would have been a death sentence right then. So Paul does the only thing he knows to do is he appeals his case to Caesar himself. And as a Roman citizen, that was his right. And so Festus says, okay, you want to go to Caesar? Then we'll send you to Caesar. And he sticks Paul on a ship to sail across the Mediterranean Sea. You may remember this story. A huge storm comes and Paul gets a vision from God that says, this thing's not going to end well. This ship's going down and you need to protect everybody. And so the Paul gives some instructions to the people to help save their life. And sure enough, the storm runs them aground and the ship breaks apart and everybody's in the water and they sail, or I'm sorry, they swim to an island named Malta. But everybody survives. Paul gets up, goes to collect some firewood to dry off his clothes from the seawater. And while he's doing that, a viper was hidden in the wood latches onto his arm and all of the people, the island uh, natives say, oh, well, he's dead. I mean, the gods tried to kill him in the ocean, didn't do it that way, so now they're going to kill him with a viper. Paul just shakes it off and he doesn't die. Finally, Paul makes it to Rome. And the book of Acts ends with the apostle Paul in the city of Rome. And here's what Acts chapter 28 says. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. In other words, Paul's put under house arrest and every day, 24 hours a day, there's a soldier that is chained to his arm. And he waits for trial before Caesar in Rome for two years. And it was while Paul was in Rome waiting to go to trial before Caesar with this guard chained to his arm that he's writing this letter we call Philippians. So that is the context of what Paul says in Philippians 1. He says, all of these things have happened to me in the last 10 years. Now imagine being in a world without Facebook or Instagram and, and, and the people from Philippi likely heard bits and pieces of these stories, some of the things that have happened to Paul. And they're worried about him. 
And it would be safe to assume that the work of God has been stopped because of all of this opposition that Paul has had to endure. It would be safe to, uh, to assume that the work that he was trying to accomplish has been stymied because of all of these tragedies that keep happening. It would be safe to assume that God's plan isn't working. Because if God's plan was working, none of this bad stuff would be happening to him. Which brings us back to Philippians 1. Paul writes, Now I want you to know, church in Philippi, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me over these last 10 years, all of these bad things that you've heard year after year after year, all of these things that have happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. All of these bad things have actually served to advance the gospel. Paul says all of these things, the terrible imprisonments, the beatings, the riots, the shipwrecks, the death plots, all of this personal pain and suffering that I've endured for a decade, it isn't as if God has worked in spite of these things, that gospel has advanced because of these things. That's what Paul says. Because of them. Which we ask, how? How do these terrible things help to advance the gospel? Well, Paul gives us right here in our text, he gives us a couple. Here's the first one. He says, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result of all of these terrible things that have happened over the last 10 years, as a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. So the first way that he mentions that the gospel has advanced because of these terrible things is that all of these guards who are chained to him, like they're doing eight-hour shifts every other day, 24 hours, three different guys chained every single day. All of them have heard about Jesus now because they have to be chained to Paul. Like all of them. All of the palace guard, the whole palace guard, they've all been rotating for two years. Now they all know about Jesus because they're chained to Paul. Have you ever met a new grandparent or someone who is like uber into CrossFit or essential oils or a vegan diet? Have you ever met somebody who's super into those things? If you have, you would know it because they're going to tell you. Like again and again and again. They just won't stop talking about it. You want them to, but they won't. (laughs) That's Paul with Jesus. Like he's not going to stop talking about Jesus. Again, these guys are, these poor guys, they're chained to him every single day for eight hours a day. The text says they're from the palace guard or the imperial guard. These are like, Caesar's own private police are the ones who are chained to Paul every single day. And every single day, Paul has them held captive. They can't go anywhere. And so he's just preaching the gospel. And every one of them have become aware of the fact that he is not in jail because he has committed a crime. He is in jail because he is committed to Christ. Which brings us to the first point I want to make today. I asked the question at the beginning. What does your suffering tell people about your Savior? Like when they watch you, when they interact with you in the midst of your suffering, what do they learn about your Savior? Because I think in this text, we, we learn a lot about Paul's Savior by looking at his actions in the midst of his suffering. And here's the first thing that I think we learn about Paul's Savior. When these guards witness Paul's suffering, they see a Savior worth suffering for. When they see Paul's suffering, they see in him a Savior who is worth suffering for. They look at Paul and say, to Paul, His Savior is worth taking a beating for. That guy's Savior is worth being in chains for. That guy's Savior is worth giving up everything for. 
That guy's savior to him is worth dying for. That man's savior is worth celebrating and sharing no matter his circumstances. Which begs the question, what does your suffering tell people about your savior? I heard a song this week that I just put on repeat all week long. And it had a line in it that I just can't get out of my head. The line is this. For the one who gave me life, nothing is a sacrifice. Think about that for a second. If you truly believe that Jesus is all and has given you all, what could he ask of you that would be a sacrifice? If he truly is your life and he's truly all to you, what could he ask you to give up that would be an actual sacrifice for you? To the one who gave me life, there is no such thing as a sacrifice. Because it's all from him and it's all for him. This is what those guards got to see every day in Paul. That there is no such thing as a sacrifice for him because of who his Savior is. That's his attitude in the midst of suffering. And when people saw it, when these guards saw it, it impacted them. So much so. It impacted these guards so much that I want you to look at the end of this letter. Philippians chapter 4. Here's how this letter ends. Don't miss this. Paul's writing to the church in Philippi from Rome, and he says, all God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. These palace guards were stuck listening to Paul for two years, and it impacted them so much that the gospel made it back to Caesar's household. This letter was written in 61 AD. You know who the emperor was? You know who this Caesar was? Nero himself. There were people in Nero's household who came to faith because his soldiers got chained to Paul all day. And it changed them because they watched him suffer. But it's not just unbelievers who were impacted by watching Paul suffer. Paul says, and because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So it's not just the unbelievers who are affected, so are the believers. Most of the brothers and sisters have heard about Paul being in chains and their witnessing Paul's suffering has actually made them more confident in the Lord. More confident. And because they are more confident watching Paul suffer, they actually proclaim the gospel now without fear. Which seems so backwards to me. It would seem as if you watch Paul suffer. He gets thrown in jail. He gets beat all the time. Everywhere he goes, a riot breaks out. He ends up in prison, not just for a year, but years upon years. I mean, he spent four of the last five years in prison. It would seem as if you would look at Paul and his suffering for the sake of the gospel and you would think, yeah, I kind of don't want to do that. I mean, we should probably just go underground a little while and, and slow roll this thing because I don't want to end up where Paul is. I mean, it, every time something happens, it's bad in his life. So I don't want that. Let's just chill it out just a little bit until things get better. Paul says, no, that's not what happens. Actually, when they see my suffering, they become more confident and become more fearless. They are preaching it more and more. They see his courage. They see his perseverance. They see his positive attitude in the face of difficulties that most of them will never have to endure. They become more confident. Paul's suffering gives them confidence. Or we could say it this way. Here's number two. When these brothers and sisters witness Paul's suffering, what they see is a Savior who is faithful no matter the circumstances. They look at Paul's suffering and they see the faithfulness of a Savior who doesn't quit on him, who doesn't leave him, 
Because Paul is showing them that God is faithful even when you're in chains. Does your attitude, do your actions in the midst of suffering show other believers the faithfulness of Christ? Or does your suffering, when your attitude in the midst of your suffering, does it cause people to question the faithfulness of Christ? I've actually seen both. I've seen some who were suffering. And their suffering emboldened me. It made me see God's faithfulness in the midst of their suffering. And I've seen others who suffer so poorly that it actually made me question the faithfulness of Jesus. And I want to be the second. I want to be the one who's, who's suffering. My attitude and actions in the midst of suffering actually point to God's faithfulness. I cause people to question it. Paul continues. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. Now, if you're one of those people who like to keep your pastors on a pedestal, this might be a good time for you to plug your ears, check your email, or go for a bathroom break. <laughs> because the reality is, what we see in this text and what I can personally attest to, is that pastors are petty. Let me make it more personal. Your pastor is petty. There, there's often this undercurrent of rivalry that happens between pastors. Um, you go to a conference and it's, there's just this rivalry that happens. Or often you've seen, many of you have been a part of a church that kind of looks at the other churches in the city as somehow their competition. And there's this rivalry that happens and it's all around, well, who gets the bigger church and who has the most sermon views and who gets the bigger speaking engagements and who gets the book deal and who has the most Twitter followers and the most famous reputation. And it's disgusting. It's ugly. It's petty. And what this text reveals is that it's not new. It's not new. Imagine for a moment that you are a pastor in the city of Rome. And you're pastoring a small church there, or maybe even a large church there in Rome. And things are going well and you're feeling pretty good about your life and your ministry. And then all of a sudden, of all of the people in the world, guess who shows up into your town? The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul shows up. And there is no one in the history of Christianity from the first century until now who has, sh who has cast a bigger shadow on the church than the Apostle Paul, like nobody. And so imagine the Apostle Paul shows up into your town. And it's like, how am I supposed to compare with that? I mean, the, how did he come to faith? Jesus showed up and called him out on the road to Damascus. Like literally, voices from heaven call him into the kingdom. I got raise your hand and bow your head and pray this prayer after me. He gets Jesus showing up and calling him by name from heaven. When he learns the gospel, how did, how did Paul learn his theology? It was Jesus for two years downloading the gospel all of the theology of Scripture, downloading it to Paul one-on-one -on -one for two years, private discipleship with Jesus. I got six years of Sunday school. He gets download from Jesus. Paul, I mean, this guy, everywhere he goes, he plants a church. Like, he just shows up in a town. People are saved, and a church pops out. And then he goes to the next town, and it happens again, and again, and again, and again. That's what happens. 
Paul is so big. He is so filled with the Spirit. He has such, compa- uh, such passion and conviction that when the Apostle Peter, you know, the one that Jesus said, on this rock I'll build my church, Peter. When Peter steps out of line, the Apostle Paul has all the confidence to walk up to Peter, stand face to face and call him out on his sin in the middle of everyone, and he's right. I mean, that's Paul. If you are a pastor with any insecurity, imagine how it would make you feel when Paul sets up shop next door. I mean, literally, literally, when Paul writes a letter to people, it becomes the very word of God. How do you compete with that? So imagine how you must feel if you're one of these pastors and Paul shows up and then your congregation comes in. Oh my goodness, did you hear? Paul got arrested and he's right down the street. And they're letting him hold Bible studies out of his, out of his house arrest. I mean, pastor, you're great and all, but I'm not going to be here on Sunday because, well, Paul's in town. <laughs> so what do you do if you're one of those pastors? Well, according to Philippians 1, one of two things happened. There were some who preached out of goodwill. Like, they're like, praise God Paul's here. We need all the help we can get. We're going to keep sharing the gospel and hope more people come to faith. Praise God that Paul's here. But there's another group. And the text says they preach Christ out of envy and rivalry. In fact, they preach Christ out of a selfish ambition. They want Paul's platform. They want Paul's influence. They want to have what Paul has. They want their name and fame to rival Paul's. So they are, they are preaching out of a selfish ambition, out of a sense of rivalry and envy for the platform that Paul has. And the reason they're preaching, they're preaching a good gospel that saves people, but the motive behind it is so that they can stir up trouble for Paul while he's in chains. In other words, we want, to, we want more people to come to Jesus. We're going to share the gospel, but the, the motive is we're going to raise a ruckus in the town with all of these Christians by growing our churches so that the authorities get mad. And when they get mad because there's ruckus being raised by all these people coming to Jesus, who are they going to get mad at? Oh yeah, they're going to get mad at Paul, because they know him. He's the name and the face for this whole movement. The more people we can get to love Jesus, the more trouble we can get Paul in. We're on it. And it's sick. And it's ugly. And that's what they do. It's one thing when your opponent sets you up to get you in trouble. It's a whole other thing when it comes from friendly fire. When it is your own teammate taking you out because of their own envy and rivalry. But that's what Paul's enduring. And yet, I want you to look at his response. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And if that happens, I'll rejoice. I don't care if it gets me in trouble as long as Christ is preached. What does this teach us about Paul's Savior? When the church witnesses Paul's suffering at the hands of these jealous pastors, they see a Savior who's worthy of all glory. They see a Savior worthy of all glory. Paul says, I don't care if I'm forgotten. I don't care if no one knows my name. I don't care if I don't get the credit. I don't care. I'm not preaching for my own name or my own fame. Paul says, I'm serving a Savior who's worthy of all the glory. And so as long as he gets preached, I don't care who gives the credit or what happens to me. I don't care about their motives. All I care is that Christ gets preached. Can you say that? For those of you who have ministries, can you say that? Do you care if if no one knows your name? Do you care if somebody else gets the credit? Are you willing to suffer personal loss? 
If the outcome means that Jesus still gets glory, are you okay with that? I don't care what it costs me as long as people come to Jesus. Paul's suffering tells us something about his Savior. And that isn't all. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. And I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage. So that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. But what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. Ultimately, I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. This is one of the most well-known texts in all of the book of Philippians. But I don't want you to miss the context. Paul is awaiting trial, chained to a soldier in the city of Rome, and he does not know if he's going to live or if he's going to die. But either way, he does expect to be delivered. I will be delivered, whether it's them cutting off the chains or them cutting off my head. Either way, I will be delivered. And again, what's his concern? That Christ is exalted, whether by my life or by my death. Whichever, in the body, I just want Christ exalted. Paul wants nothing more than to be with Jesus. Paul's given the option, is it life or death? Paul says, if I get an option and I get to choose that, I choose death. Just take me. I want to die. Option B, I pick B. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. You want to live, Paul, or you want to die? Die, die, every day die. Give me the, that option. Because all I want is to be with Jesus. That's better by far. Can you say that? If you were given that option today as you leave, you can live or die. Which one do you want? Most of us, we probably aren't with Paul on this one. Better by far? To which we may wonder, better? Better than America? (laughs) Better than coffee? Better than my team in the Super Bowl, Paul? Being dead with Christ is better than camping? Better than winning the Powerball? Better than retirement? Better than being with my grandkids? Better than having another decade with my wife by my side? You're saying it's better than that? Better than getting to see my children grow up? Paul, can you really, you really believe that it's better than getting to see my toddler Grow up, walking my daughter down the aisle, better than that? All of those things are fine in Paul's mind, but he says, oh yeah, it's better by far. Actually, to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's so much better. It's gain. It's like a whole other level better. To which again, we look at Paul, and that tells us something about his Savior. Paul's suffering teaches us that he believes that in his Savior is fullness of joy. Like fullness of joy, the greatest amount of joy that can ever be experienced ever in the universe comes in the presence of Jesus, which is what makes being with Jesus better by far. In his presence is fullness of joy. Death is better By far, it is gain over anything and everything that you have ever experienced or will ever experience. I heard a pastor named John Piper put it this way. That Christ is worth more than all this life can give. And he is worth more than all that death can take. 
Christ is worth more than anything this life can give and he is worth more than all that death can take. Do you believe that today? Do you truly believe that today? That you'd volunteer, take my life because that's better by far. When people look at you in the midst of your suffering, do they see someone who's willing to leave everything this life has to offer behind with joy? Knowing that being in the presence of Jesus is better by far. Here's the last one. I'd rather depart and be with Jesus. It's better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Paul wants nothing more than to be with Jesus, yet at the end of the day, being in his Savior's will is more important than being in his Savior's presence. Being in his Savior's will is more important than being in his Savior's presence. So much so that Paul is willing to forego his own greatest joy of being in the presence of Jesus. He says, I know, but it's better, not for me, but it's better for you. It's more necessary for you that I stay. Paul is willing to stay on earth and suffer And not be where he wants to be in his Savior's presence. To not experience his ultimate joy. So that those who he is is ministering to will grow in their own progress and joy in the faith. He's willing to give up his joy. So that ultimately the other people get to experience joy in Jesus. He's willing to suffer for them. Which teaches us something, one last thing about Paul's Savior. Paul's suffering teaches us that his Savior is worth sharing. Paul says, I'll stay and suffer. I won't experience the joy that I want so that you could have the joy that I want. Paul's suffering teaches us his Savior is worth sharing no matter what it costs him. I want to end where we began today. I ask this question, what does your suffering tell others about your Savior? Does your suffering show Jesus to be faithful and mighty and loving and powerful and worthy of all glory and worth every cost to share? Or does your suffering, your actions and your attitude in the midst of your suffering show Jesus as inept and weak, and cruel, and insufficient. Suffering is a part of every human story, and Christians are not exempt. In fact, we're promised more suffering as a follower of Jesus. Your story will have suffering in it. And I just want to make sure that we, as an ecclesia, as a body of Christ, as a bunch of followers of Jesus, that when suffering is written into our story, Our actions and attitude in the midst of our suffering show off Jesus as glorious and worth pursuing no matter what it costs. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would give us strength in the midst of our suffering, that we would find you faithful and that we would continue to follow even in the midst of our own pain. And that as others look at us in the midst of our suffering, they would see a Savior worth suffering for. And we ask you to do that by the power of the Spirit in us. In Jesus' name, amen.